Yeah. No, don't use the video because. Okay. Hello, good, e uh, good evening and good morning wherever you are, whether it's morning or evening, but greetings to all of you. Thank you for coming to this uh, discussion um, and uh, lecture. Uh, we, <clears throat> unfortunately, we have load shedding and so my computer is a little bit unstable. But uh, nevertheless, we're going to start with the prayer today. And um, I'd like to ask Uma to introduce the prayer and the music. Uma, please. Yes. In December 2023, a group of religious leaders from South Africa and elsewhere went to Bethlehem and the Palestinian priest of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Reverend Munta Isaac, delivered a sermon to mark their presence. Nick Payton, who is a well-known musician and composer, edited his sermon and set it to music composed by him. In a program that marks death and with a seminar on dying, it is appropriate to note the death of 25,105 Palestinians since the 7th of October, most of them being women and children. Pastor Isaac concludes his sermon with the statement that Jesus is under the rubble. He is at home with the marginalized, the suffering, the oppressed and the displaced. This is his manger. We have searched for God and found him under the rubble. Let us listen to Nick Payton's Under the Rubble. This would have been a time of joy. Instead, we are mourning. We are not humans in their eyes. In the shadow of the empire, they turned the colonizer into the victim. They think about the Prince of Peace in their land while playing the drum of war in our land. Psalms of lament have become a precious companion to us. We cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us? In our pain, lament, we have searched for God and found him under the rubble to our friends who are here with us, you embody the term accompaniment, costly solidarity. Think of the words of Jesus. We were in prison. Jesus is under the rubble. When we justify, rationalize, and theologize the bombing of children, Jesus is under the rubble. He's at home with the marginalized, the suffering, the oppressed, and the displaced. This is his main journey. We have searched for God and found him under the rubble in Ghaz. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, rendition uh, to Nick uh, Payton. Uh, for those who may not know, Nick Payton is the son of Dr. Alan Payton. And Dr. Alan Payton was um, part of the Centenary Committee 
of Ghana, uh, of Phoenix settlement in 1969, when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the birth of uh, Gandhiji. So it's quite appropriate that we've got his music today when we are also, whilst we are uh, mourning the passing of Gandhiji, we are also celebrating 120 years of Phoenix settlement this year. And so uh, we remember the, the centenary of 1969 as we celebrate 120 years of Phoenix settlement this year. I would like to ask now if uh, Linda Zama is with us. And if she is, will she give a message from the Premier's office? There was a little bit of doubt whether she is going to be able to make it. But if she is here, may I call her to speak? Linda Sama? She's not here, Auntie Hila. She's not here. Okay. Hashila. Um, yeah. So um, we, Hashila Narsi, will take us through the 120 years program that we are thinking of, um, you know, for this year. Hashila, can I call on you to do that, please? Yes, thank you, Ila, and thank you for everyone coming. A very good evening to you all. So um, my task here today is to talk to you about the 120th anniversary of the Phoenix Settlement. This year is 120 years since the establishment of the Phoenix Settlement. I'm sure most of you have been there and know what it looks like. Uh, it's in Inanda, and it's a very significant year in the calendar of not only the Phoenix Settlement Trust, but the broader South African community. As you know, the Phoenix Settlement was established by Mahatma Gandhi in 1904, and since then it has served as a center for the promotion of social justice and nonviolent resistance not only against colonialism, but also against the apartheid struggles. Now the celebration of this anniversary therefore provides us with a huge opportunity um, to reflect on the Gandhi's legacy. Um, I saw a message by somebody, is, the, is everything okay, uh, Kirti, in terms of sound? Okay, I will continue. Can you all hear me? Yes, Ashila, go on. Okay, thank you. So the theme for this year's um, a celebration of the 120 years is nonviolence and peace. And Ila, please um, correct me if I'm wrong. And this is especially important in the context of Gaza and the wars that are going on all over the world or in many parts of the world uh, in this year. Uh, there are many activities planned uh, for this year, and um, uh, today is the first one of them. Uh, some of them will be held at the Phoenix Settlement, others will be virtual. So for example, tomorrow there will be a meeting of the interfaith community at the Phoenix Settlement at which the program for the year will be discussed and um, hopefully adopted. So some of the, uh, so there'll be many uh, uh, seminars at the Phoenix Settlement, several webinars. There'll be the celebration of Youth Day, Mandela Day, Media, Media Day, uh, Paddy Carney, celebration of Paddy Carney. But everything will, uh, 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 will culminate in the launch of a book on Phoenix Settlement that has been written by Uma. And we plan to have that launch in October at the Phoenix Settlement. And, um, uh, and hopefully many of you would be able to join us there. Um, more details of the program will be shared with everyone. 
as time goes on. And the program is not only confined to Durban, it's um, UMA will also have something in Cape Town uh, with a group of interfaith people. Um, and Kirti will organize something in Johannesburg at Wits University. And um, then there are people from India who have shown a great amount of interest in wanting to do something for this year. So they are also keen on doing something and we could we will hear more about them. Uh, finally, uh, as a reminder, just in case people are not aware, um, the Phoenix Settlement has been declared a national heritage site by our government. And so we are doing everything we can uh, to promote the tourism uh, to the settlement. And uh, right now, Eli in particular is working very hard with an organization in the USA to have Phoenix Settlement declared as a UNESCO heritage site. So the Phoenix Settlement is really, um, really an important place in the history of this country and its importance will be uh, characterized and will be st stamped as a, when it's declared as a UNESCO uh, heritage site. So colleagues, that's broadly our program for the year. Uh, for the uh, 120 year celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Harshila. I'm sorry, I can't uh, put on my video uh, because, uh, you know, we have load shedding and I've got to conserve the battery life on this uh, computer, on the laptop. But thank you very much, Harshila, for that. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge that quite a few people are here with us today, particularly Zubi Kuvadia, Dr. Zubi Kuvadia, who is the mother of the person who's going to give us the lecture today. Uh, welcome, Zubi, and all the others. Um, welcome to the Consul General of India, Consul General of USA and uh, many other people. I think uh, Sudarshanji from um, California is here um, and many other, Fresno, Fresno University is with us. Um, Jay Nair, Billy Nair's brother is with us. And uh, yeah, so welcome to all of you. Um, May I call on Uma to please uh, introduce our speaker for the day, for this evening? Professor Kuvadia, uh, I want to thank you first for accepting this invitation to give us your thoughts on uh, on on the three great icons, uh, Mandela, uh, Gandhi, and Tolstoy. Uh, Professor Kuvadia is the Director of Creative Writing Program at the University of Cape Town. Born in Durban, he has been educated at some of the finest educational institutions, Hilton College, Harvard College, and Yale University. He came to the attention of the world with the publication of his debut no novel, The Wedding Singer, in 2001. It tells the story of love and marriage and migration from India to South Africa. And it is told with wicked, delicious humor. I had the occasion to reread this book um, only at, uh, last year, and it still has stood the test of time and it still is able to make one laugh and enjoy the beautiful writing of Imran Kavadia. Since then, Imran Kuvadia broadened out from the Durban story and the Indian story. His other novels include Green-Eyed Thieves, High Low In Between, The Institute for Taxi Poetry, Tales of the Metric System, A Spy in Time, and his books have scooped him awards such as the Sunday Times Fiction Prize and the University of Johannesburg Prize in 2010, and the MNET Literary Award in 2012. He has also made a very significant contribution in the nonfiction genre, having published a book of short essays called Transformations, which
which won him an award from the Essay Literary Awards. The topics in that book actually range from Tolstoy to the Vuvuzela. He's written a book assessing the writings of B.S. Snipal, a literary giant originating from the Caribbean. In 2021, he published a book on the use of poison in politics and war in Southern Africa. And Imran's publishers have been very prestigious. Uh, Ram Random House, Picador, Seagull Books, Ohio University Press, and Oxford University Press. In 2020, as the world found itself changed and shattered during COVID, Professor Kuvadia's book, Revolution and Nonviolence in Tolstoy, Gandhi and Mandela, made a very quiet entry on the book stage. This is a magnum opus deserving of a far greater attention than it has received, bringing together three towering figures from Russia, India, and South Africa. Professor Kuvadia delves into um, their book libraries for what they have read, what they have written, and what brings them together. This is a magnificent contribution to the history of ideas. Professor Kuvadia is a very appropriate speaker today for his own family history, links him to Gandhi and Phoenix. Ibrahim Kuvadia, his great, great uncle, was a contemporary of Gandhi's in the Transvaal. And together they tested the rights of Indians to travel on the electric trams in Johannesburg. Professor Jerry Kuvadia, Imran's father, is very well known to the Phoenix Settlement Trust since he served on the Phoenix Settlement Trust in the 1980s. Every year, there used to be an annual Gandhi lecture at Phoenix, um, right from the 1970s onwards. And Professor Jerry Kovadia delivered a lecture at Phoenix in the early 1980s, which is Gandhi's relevance in contemporary times. It is a lecture that is worth circulating and listening to again. Today, his son will speak about three iconic figures and the title of his talk is Death is the Truest of Friends, Gandhi, Mandela, and Tolstoy, and the Art of Dying. Thank you. Imran, over to you. Thank you um, so much, Uma, for that very kind introduction. It's an honor to speak with, with you and Ila and um, with uh, members of the Phoenix Trust today. And... Of course, we're commemorating the anniversary of Gandhi's assassination on the 30th of January, 1948, at the hands of Naturam Godse. And I think we should remember the day in the spirit of Gandhi. He imagined death not as a defeat, but as a kind of victory. Heroes, he believed, are made in the hour of defeat. Success can be described as a series of glorious defeats. The framework of nonviolence that he introduced or deepened, places emphasis on the mode in which someone dies. History, he says, is full of men who, by dying with courage and compassion on their lips, converted the hearts of their most violent opponents, particularly in the context of the partition of India when Gandhi died and the rivalry between Pakistan and India, which has dominated the subcontinent. Gandhi pre predicted that only my death will determine whether I am Muhammad Gandhi, i.e. a kind of defector from Hinduism, whether I am Jinnah's slave, right? In other words, an accomplice of Pakistan, Jinnah was the leader of Pakistan, whether I'm a destroyer of the Hindu religion or its true servant and protector. So Gandhi believed that his own death was going to be decisive for understanding his life and was going to be a kind of, he believed or hoped that it would be a kind of victory. And I think that's how we should think of it as in a way, something as constructive as the creation of the Phoenix Settlement or the Ashram. Between the 1890s, when he arrived in South Africa, and the 1940s, um, when he was assassinated, Gandhi brought the risk of his own death into anti-colonial politics. Across hundreds of years, politics has seen very few innovations. You know, that's why we think so lowly often of politicians. But Gandhi was an amazingly original 
figure in modern politics. His way of threatening to fast to death, for example, you know, he said, if, if you don't stop what you're doing, I'm going to fast and fast until, until I die. It was directed both inwards. It was a way of restraining his own followers when they strayed from the values of nonviolence. And it was also directed outwards at his political opponents who had to ask themselves, am I willing in upholding these unjust laws to take Gandhi's life? So he made the risk of his death something that tested both his followers and his adversaries. In this sense, Gandhi made us see death as a more profound form of jail, a kind of voluntary sacrifice. But there's more than that. Gandhi's volunteer work brought him into the midst of death and killing. In 1899, during the siege of Ladysmith, during the Second Boer War, Gandhi had actually formed the Natal Indian Ambulance Corps he matched the Natal Volunteer Ambulance Corps, which was a whites-only corps of medical orderlies. And he led the Indian Stretcher Bearer Corps again in 1906 during the Bambata Rebellion, and he treated many injured Zulu combatants. That experience, I think it's widely believed, contributed towards the formation of Satyagraha, you know, the full-blown theory and practice of nonviolence later in September of the same year, 1906. Courage and strength of mind are qualities that connect the soldiers that Gandhi served with and the battlefieldness that he became, and later to the civil resistor, the person who tests society by breaking its laws and essentially daring society to arrest him. In one of Gandhi's most paradoxical formulations, he said that he who has lost the power to kill cannot practice non killing. Nevertheless, we're talking in Gandhi's case, principally about death, not killing, and death as a fresh route into what we call decolonization or political independence or political freedom. Compare Gandhi's view to Frantz Fanon, whose perspective, as it was summarized by Sartre, held that killing a European in Algeria is killing two birds with one stone, eliminating in one go oppressor and oppressed, leaving one man dead and the other man free. But Fanon's pleasure in this thought of a kind of fight to the death and uh, a deadly blow which would free you from the, 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 the hold of oppression could not have been more alien to, to Gandhi or to Mandela or Tolstoy. Gandhi's relationship to death in many ways is the deepest of his career and not just his political career. And it's the opposite of what we call a living death, the way that Gandhi lived alongside death. We often use words like nothingness, blankness, or void to express our own views of death. But in this void, Gandhi found a source of very productive energy. He found death as a source of life. Um, and I'm, you know, one intuitive way to think about this is my nine-year-old, uh, Jasper, discovered a few weeks ago that somebody, one of his school friends, I think, told him that he was going to die. And he, I don't know why his school friend told him this, but he came home and he said that, now he knew that he's going to die. He is going to not waste, not going to be sure not to waste his life. So I think it, for many of us, death has that accelerating quality. Um, but for Gandhi, again, it, his exploration and drawing on death went even deeper. Very interesting ways. Let me go on. He said in the title I chose for this lecture, it's just a quotation from, from Gandhi, death is not a fiend but the truest of friends. And let's start with the most salient word in that sentence, which of course is friends. What does it mean to call death a friend? What is a friend? Friendship is voluntary companionship. Right? The bond of a friend to another friend is an idealized form of community. Unlike family or clan or race, we choose our friends and we choose to be with them. You know, We never have to be with a friend by necessity. A friend is someone who allows your real self to appear, the self that you're most comfortable with. Right? And Gandhi also believes that death is the truest of friends. What does that mean? It means that no friend is a better friend than death, perhaps because death allows no pretenses and is conclusive. It reveals something about your entire life. And if death is your friend, as ancient Greek Stoicism understood, life has no fears. Why is it unusual to see death in this way? Because we have a survival instinct like other animals. Our instinct resists pain and by extension death, which we see rightly or wrongly as a kind of ultimate pain or injury. Furthermore, unlike 
all or almost all other animals, we are able, we have the power of foresight. I mean, limited foresight in many cases, but we have a general power of foresight and we can form narratives and images of our own deaths, the deaths of the people we love and are close to, and even of the times which follow our deaths. And those are the ways that death inserts itself into our lives, into our minds. Gandhi, I think, and I've, you know, as um, Uma mentioned the book I'd written about these three extraordinary men, Gandhi belongs with Leo Tolstoy and Nelson Mandela as three men who show us the way to a richer way of living as death-bound creatures. Why should we group Gandhi with Tolstoy and Mandela? Well, some of it is by coincidence. Tolstoy's last substantial correspondence out of letter writing in 1910 was actually conducted with Gandhi, who wrote to him in Russia to inform him of the progress of nonviolence in Southern Africa. You know, he said, we are basically implementing your thoughts about non-cooperation with evil far away from Russia, all the way across the world. And Tolstoy replied enthusiastically. He saw Gandhi as a collaborator in a global task of the renunciation of all opposition by force, a project in which all the peoples of the world can participate. Tolstoy even accepted Gandhi's sense of how important or central South Africa is. This struggle, he agreed, is the greatest of modern times. Although in his response, he also brought out a certain play of perspectives. He was a writer, after all. He said, your work in the Transvaal, right? That, at that point, the Transvaal was an independent republic. It seems to us to be at the ends of the earth, but it is in the center of our interest. But for our purposes, the most interesting feature of Tolstoy's letter is that he sees himself as having reached a place outside the enclosing perspectives of an individual human life. Now, he wrote to Gandhi, when I feel the approach of death. Like Gandhi, seeing and Tolstoy was seeing and shaping life in his final years from its boundary, from the kind of the dividing line between life and death. So Gandhi and Tolstoy are very close in many ways. Why Mandela also? Because Mandela chose Gandhi as his primary predecessor. He came to maturity as 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 we know, you know, in the um, in the midst of Gandhian lineages of resistance, organizations, people, members of Gandhi's family. In fact, Mandela considered Gandhi the archetypal anti-colonial revolutionary. He believed that anti-colonialism started with Gandhi's stepping off the train, you know, being forced to, to leave the train in Peter Maritzburg a hundred odd years ago. He wrote, he wrote that in the year 2000 as he prepared to go into political retirement. According to Mandela, Gandhi dared to exhort nonviolence in a time when the violence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had exploded on us. He exhorted morality when science, technology, and the capitalist order had made it redundant. He replaced self-interest with group interest without minimizing the importance of self. He was both an Indian and a South African and shaped the liberatory movements in both theaters. And Della surprisingly intuitively right. I mean, you know, he was obviously not a scholar, had no time to be an academic, but he has amazing intuition about what's important about, you know, other people, other figures, and, and what's necessary in politics. And he went to great lengths to justify his own deviation from nonviolence when he founded Umkanto, of course. Um, but of course, Umkanto, we see where in its early years, under Mandela's supervision, came as close to practicing nonviolence as a guerrilla organization ever could. You know, it had a very carefully controlled um, use of violence against property, went out of its way to make sure that no one was harmed. So I don't think it's impossible to think of Mandela as a Gandhian of a kind, and other people have as well. But since we're here to commemorate the anniversary of Gandhi's assassination, as well as the founding of the Phoenix Settlement, we should recall the circumstances under which he died. Despite his standing in India in the 1940s, he didn't. Maybe he couldn't attain the blessings of a serene old age. You know, some of us have the ability to become more and more peaceful and almost blessed as we get older, and some of us become more and more, you know, we raise the challenges or we become more irritable. And then I don't know which exactly Gandhi fell into, but he definitely didn't have a serene old age. And in many ways, the last section of his life was the most challenging to the assumptions and deductions of nonviolence. 
As you know, the World War between 1939 and 1945 meant the total mobilization of states and people in their tens and hundreds of millions for the purpose of coordinated violence, genocidal violence in the case of the death camps, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, arguably the firebombing of German cities. Violence at this scale undermined the plausibility of nonviolence, which for Gandhi was by nature an individual and private matter. You know, even if you practice nonviolence in a crowd with other people, you are always doing it as an individual, trying to act on another individual, one person risking your body for another person, risking your body to turn the conscience of an aggressor against itself. But long range killing, which of course is the modern form of warfare from the sniper's rifle to artillery, incendiary airstrikes, and finally the atomic bombs meant that there was no longer face-to-face -face contact between adversaries, which was a problem for Satyagraha, for nonviolence, which was born in these small scale civil society encounters with the colonial police force, where someone has to think, they have to see your face, they have to talk to you, they might even know your name before they decide to jail you or arrest you. It's very different to the kind of violence of an atomic bomb. Could you, for example, practice Satyagraha against a figure like Adolf Hitler? Gandhi tried, and I think it's probably a surprise to, to many of us, to read his short letter. He wrote two letters to Hitler, one of the two dated December 24th, 1940. Kind of brings up a certain frustration in, in one as a reader. He wrote to Hitler, we have no doubt about your bravery or devotion to your fatherland, but you will lose nothing. Instead of fighting, you lose nothing by referring all the matters of dispute between you and Great Britain to an international tribunal. So I think many people in retrospect find that a very challenging letter to accept. Gandhi's advice to German Jews in the 1940s is even more difficult to accept. He, he wrote to them that the calculated violence of Hitler may result in a general massacre of the Jews. But if the Jewish mind could be prepared for voluntary suffering, even the massacre I have imagined could be turned into a day of thanksgiving and joy. Again, extremely paradoxical, complicated thought, but it's precisely in these limits when we test the methods and principles of nonviolence that we see where the logic leads us and how far we can go along with it and what kinds of insights it presents. But the fear of death, acceptance of death, even the pursuit of death, is where the social world and our private worlds come together. And Gandhi's gift in many ways was to see how life, death, politics, and decolonization could be connected. Talk briefly about the 1940s, but for Gandhi, by far the gravest challenge in his later years was the bloodshed of India's partition in 1947, which was a consequence of decolonization. The conflict undermined Gandhi's way of incorporating or incarnating in his own person the kind of harmonious coexistence of religious traditions. Right? Think, for example, the way he adopted the geopolitical goals of the Muslim community by pursuing the Khilafat movement uh, between 1919 and 1922. Or think of the way that he called himself a follower of Guru Gobind Singh you know, to kind of harmonize his views with Sikhism. Um, and also think, by the way, of his willingness to criticize his own community, right? Gujarati-speaking merchants. In other words, he was someone who was particularly aware of the faults of the people who were closest to him and less inclined to indulge them, and particularly willing to adopt and adapt and form fraternal bonds with other religions and other faith traditions and communities. So partition was a great challenge. Despite those severe challenges, in the middle of partition, on 27 May 1947, Gandhi recorded his condition in a letter to a friend. He said, I am in the midst of a raging fire. Is it God's mercy or an irony of fate that the flames do not consume me? What did he mean by that? Why did he feel unscathed by partition? Because I think he was untouched by partisanship, by nationalism, and by the entangling passions of violent politics. Gandhi ultimately extended the religious tradition of possessing an unviolated conscience into the political world, and especially into the sphere of decolonization. Nobody, by the way, had ever done that before, and pretty much no one ever would after him. But he brought the profound, challenging, and transformative qualities of religion into politics, rather than its dogmatic or partisan qualities. And again, this is an amazingly original, open, and humane thing to do. Of course, 
It wasn't to everybody's satisfaction, not to people who had a different view of religion and the state. Naturam Godse and his accomplices were actually veterans of civil disobedience campaigns themselves, but they in the late 1940s had heard tales of Hindu refugees escaping from Pakistan and the kinds of difficulties they had gone through and atrocities they had faced, and they particularly resented Gandhi fasting to protest Indian policy towards Pakistan. They interpreted, they interpreted Gandhi's fast as Gandhi harming Indian national power. So in other words, their view was that the state is a central object of political organization. Gandhi said, I felt that Indian politics in the absence of Gandhiji would surely be proved practical, able to retaliate, and would be powerful with armed force. And I think those ideals of retaliation and power are exactly what Gandhi treats us to undo. Now, how hard did Godse try to kill Gandhi? I mean, it's painful to remember, but we should remember the history. In May 1944, Godse and 20 others tried to rush Gandhi at a prayer meeting, and they were only stopped from stabbing him by the intervention of the crowd. They were then released because Gandhi had a policy of refusing to lodge criminal charges against people who tried to kill him. In other words, he made himself vulnerable. He repeatedly opened his life to the risk of death. Any other person who did this, we'd call foolhardy. Faisal Devji, who's one of the greatest recent interpreters of Gandhi, reminds us that this figure of nonviolence uncannily seems to embrace, even provoke death and killing. And this is a case in point. In September of the same year, 1947, Godse tried to stop Gandhi between Sevagram and Mumbai. He was arrested with a knife. He uttered threats against Gandhi and was released yet again because Gandhi still did not lodge charges against him. Gandhi's fast to stem the violence of partition in 1947 finally prompted Godse and his collaborators to purchase a pistol and follow Gandhi. And on 20 January 1948, Godse, one of his allies, actually threw a grenade at a crowd of Gandhi's followers, hoping to isolate him and then kill him with the second grenade, but they failed. Finally, at midday 30th January, Gandhi was told that two men from the peninsula of Katiawa, Katiawa, by the way, always reminds me of Kavadia. I suspect that they have the same route. Anyway, these two men from Katiawa were meant to meet Gandhi, and Gandhi said, tell them that if I remain alive, they can talk to me after the prayer on my walk. And on that walk, as as historians have reconstructed it, he was surrounded by schoolboys, girls, uh, street sweepers, members of the armed forces, businessmen, sadhus, right, holy men, and even vendors displaying pictures of portraits of, of him, of Bapu. According to some reports, including God says, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, he actually smiled and spoke to God say. God say pushed everybody aside and shot four times. Gandhi died at 5.40 p.m., uh, on 30th January, about half an hour later. Some people report that Godse intended the 40th, fourth bullet to kill himself. How did he, the assassin, summarize his relationship to Gandhi? He said, I did not hate Gandhi. I revered him because we both venerated much in Hindu religion, Hindu history, and Hindu culture. Therefore, I bowed before Gandhi when I met him, then performed my moral duty and killed Gandhi. And I thought to myself, has any assassin ever been more converted to the man he killed? I mean, you might think of Brutus in um, the, you know, who assassinated Julius Caesar, but otherwise I can't think of a single example where an assassin has been so much under the spell of the man he, he murdered. Godse was hanged at Ambala jail on 15 November, 1948. He choked to death for 15 minutes. Godse seems to have died a death of self-violation. In other words, kind of the opposite of the way Gandhi died. You know, someone who harmed himself in his style of living and dying. Whereas concerning Gandhi, he died, if not by, if not by his own doing, then by his own values. Einstein, you know, is one of those, again, like Gandhi, one of those people who surprisingly gets things right, even when he doesn't have a whole lot of knowledge. And he said about Gandhi's death, Gandhi died as the victim of his own principles, the principle of nonviolence. He refused armed protection for himself. It's hard to think of any other leader who accepted and welcomed his own death in this way. Okay, that's about half my talk. I have about half left, if you can still concentrate. My concentration span is about the same as my nine-year-olds. Uh, um, a glance at classical Western tradition tells us something about Gandhi's originality, where his views on death come from. The first is from Herodotus. It's probably the oldest idea about death that we have handed down to us in philosophy. 
wealthy, uh, it's a story about wealthy Croesus, the king of, of uh, Sardis. We still, in English, sometimes still use the expression as wealthy as Croesus. Um, so Croesus asks Solon, who is a visiting philosopher from Athens, who is the happiest man in the world? And Croesus, of course, that he thought that he was the happiest man in the world. He was very rich. Um, and Solon thought for a while, and he said, well, look, Tellus of Athens is the happiest man in the world. And Croesus said, but Tellus is dead. How can he be the happiest man in the world? And Solon explained that you can't tell if a man is happy or not until he's dead. In the famous words, you know, count no man happy until the end is known. Anyway, Croesus wasn't happy about that answer. But, but soon after his son died in a hunting accident, he himself was struck blind. He found himself, you know, he lost a war and he found himself dying on a funeral pyre where he's still alive. And he cried out, according to the Herodotus anyway, to Solon saying, can't no man happy until the end is known. So this Greek story is really, it's a story about contingency, about accidents and the unforeseeable facts of life. But contingency and uncertainty are not major elements of Gandhi's thinking. The second Greek contribution to the theory of the good death comes, of course, from, from Plato's Phaedo. Socrates has been sentenced to death by the Athenian Republic. Socrates' friends come to visit him on the eve of his execution, and he comforts them. He says, don't worry. If we are ever to have pure knowledge, we must escape from the body and observe things in themselves with our soul by itself. It seems likely that only when we are dead shall we attain that which we desire, namely wisdom. Now, for the great scholar of the classical tradition, Pierre Hadot, training for death like this, right? Philosophy was training for death, and it meant a tearing away from everyday life, a conversion, a total transformation of one's vision, lifestyle, and behavior. This transformation of the narrow individual outlook into the universal perspective is seen in Plato's Phaedo as a kind of spiritual alteration. For the first time, says Hado, this characteristic of the philosopher, the universal perspective, receives the appellation, in the words, the label that it will maintain throughout ancient tradition, greatness of soul. Right? And I think in that closeness and readiness for death, you see Gandhi's, and also Mandela and Tolstoy's greatness of soul, and some idea of what it means to have a, a great soul. Death relates us to the universe, but it's also a profound element of politics. Who dies? Who has the right to kill? Whose death is noticed? Right? For Tolstoy, mass death and killing were the handiwork of political power. I know if you know if, if we read the newspapers, we see in almost every case when, when we have mass death, there's some kind of state or state structure behind it. For Tolstoy, that kind of killing goes along with a powerful form of denial, what Tolstoy calls hypnotism. And he describes in his diaries an encounter with a group of soldiers who were on their way to suppress a riot. He said, not one of these officers would cheat at cards. Not one would refuse to pay a debt of honor, would betray a comrade, would run away in the field of battle, or desert the flag. And they're all very honorable soldiers. Yet these healthy, good-natured young fellows were going to assist at the murder of their fathers or grandfathers. And once again, Tolstoy says, I was amazed that this hideous crime can be perpetrated so easily in broad daylight and in the midst of a large town. In 1897, Tolstoy looked into his own fear of death, and he found in it the thought that he says, everything is for us. The earth is mine. When we come to die, we're surprised that my earth, something belonging to me, will be left, but not me. The mistake, he says, is thinking of the earth as something acquired, an appendage of me, whereas I am acquired by the earth, and I'm an appendage of it. And in his diary, he developed the same thought at some length. He said, I rode past the outbuildings. I remembered the nights you know, on his estate. I remembered the nights I used to spend there and the youth and beauty of Dunyasha, who's a, you know, a, a laboring woman who lived on the estate, her strong womanly body. Where is it? It's long been nothing but bones. Where are those bones? What relation have they to Dunyasha? There was a time when those bones formed part of that separate being, which was Dunyasha. But then that being shifted its center, and what used to be Dunyasha became part of another being, enormous in size and inaccessible to me, which I call the earth. The physical unity of the body here is another inadequate form, as Tolstoy had during his life found the family, the novel, and the state inadequate. 
This memory has of Dunyasha is replaced by the trajectory of her bones. Dunyasha, her youth and beauty, her strong womanly body, is only a temporary center to be displaced and relativized by the earth. Tolstoy responded to the prospect of his own death with enthusiasm, almost. Nearing the end of his life in 1902, he registered in his diary a potentially fatal injury. Dusan has discovered gangrene in my heels. That's good. Very good. What is he relishing? What is Tolstoy relishing? By this point, he owned nothing but his clothes. He had only sharpened his skepticism about his family. He disliked what he called the greediness of my children. I gave up all my property to them in my lifetime, so they should not be tempted to wish for my death. And still, my death is what they wish for. Yes, yes, yes. Those last three words, yes, yes, yes. It's a is it a repetition of his children's dark wishes or is it a celebration? In the same year, Tolstoy composed a message to the Tsar, which seemed to come from beyond the perspective of an individual life. He said, I'm writing to you as if it were from the next world, since I expect to die very soon. I did not want to die without telling you what I think of your present activity. And obviously wasn't very complimentary. Around this time, Tolstoy imagined his death as completing the dissemination or seeding of his own life. He said, you know, he was observing himself and he said, absolutely simultaneously and parallel with the destruction of my personality. Right? All of us, as we get older, we see the destruction of our bodies, our personalities. It is parallel with the destruction of my personality, the things that my life has done, the consequence of my thoughts and feelings are beginning to live and are growing stronger and stronger, are living in other people, even in animals and in dead matter. So he was taking on a perspective beyond life, a secondary, more various life beyond his physical body. How did Tolstoy begin to live in others, in other languages, first of all? Well, three of his stories interested Gandhi enough for him to translate them into Gujarati. God sees the truth but waits. How much land does a man need? And Ivan the Fool. Uh, Gandhi almost certainly never read Tolstoy's novels, but he loved these three stories. And when you read them, they're only, you know, I really advise you to read them. There are three or four pages each. They're fascinating stories. Each is a kind of character study composed in the style of wisdom literature. And it comes close to the kind of dark riddle you find in the book of Job in the Old Testament. The first two end with a kind of ironic death, but divine, but irony. They introduce an irony, a kind of divine irony. God sees the truth, but waits. Follows a merchant, Ivan Aksyonov, who's falsely convicted of murder and exiled to Siberia. But Aksyonov actually meets the real murderer and he forgives and even protects him. Um, Makar Samyonovich. And Samyonovich confesses, but Aksyonov dies before he can return to his family. So the story suggests a kind of justice which is divorced from the desire to retaliate and which doesn't offer compensation in the way that, that we would want. In How Much Land Does a Man Need, another of Tolstoy's stories that Gandhi loved, a very acquisitive, greedy peasant called Paham wants to acquire more and more land in a increasingly distant sections of the country. So he pursues his quest right to the Urals, you know, to tribal territory on the edges of Russia. And he's told you can have as much land as you can encircle in a single day. So there's a mad rush, you know, he runs, he tries to create the biggest possible circle, obviously. Um, but he does it, he, he travels so fast that he ends up killing himself and he's buried. And the story ends with Tolstoy's very mordant reply to his own title. How much land does a man need? Only six feet from his head to his heels was all he needed. Interestingly, when Gandhi wrote about the story, he doesn't interpret it in the way that I think almost all of us would, as a criticism of acquisitiveness. Instead, he understood it as a story of self-erasure, or what he called reduction to zero. And he believed that if we could reduce ourselves to zero, we could be closer to God. He said, yes, indeed, I've read Tolstoy's How Much Land a Man Needs many times over. If Tolstoy had known much of cremation, he would even have allowed much less space. And if the body were to receive scientific reduction, it could be resolved into five elements and then no space would be needed at all. And that is precisely what our mental state should be. I think that is really one of the most remarkable pieces of literary criticism and the uh, you know development of a spiritual idea anywhere in 20th century politics or, or thinking. Three days before he was murdered by Godse, Gandhi actually recalled the character of Ivan the Fool from the third story of Tolstoy, as I mentioned. Ivan was one of three brothers. One chose to be a kind of a soldier in the service of the state. One chose to be a businessman. 
and make money on the market. And Ivan chose the path of nonviolence and farming as opposed to his brothers. And he and eventually, at the end of the story, he rises to be king, but he's the kind of king whose hands are marked by manual labor. You know, he has the kind of hands that you only get from working hard all your life. And he creates a kingdom where the only people who can sit at the high tables and be, you know, prominent in the kingdom are people who have these, you know, um, wrinkled or whatever aged hands. And three days before he was killed, Gandhi insisted that in independent India would be the world's first nonviolent state. He said, Ivan remained nonviolent even when he became king, and India will be like Ivan. Some final words, um, if you can still concentrate about Nelson Mandela and death, which starts with Shakespeare, where Mandela's uh, views were relatively conventionalized. At the Rivonia trial in 1964, Mandela prepared for the possibility of the death penalty being posed on him and his colleagues. He said, I thought of the line from Shakespeare, be absolute for death. In other words, be convinced that you're going to die. Either death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. In other words, have no hope. And then whatever happens, you know, you'll, you'll be, you'll feel good. Duke Vincentio's strange promise of pleasure Death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. Actually has the virtue here of recalling that unlike Gandhi or Tolstoy, Mandela had a relish for life, a love of living, which maybe comes from being in jail for, for two decades. On Robben Island, he gravitated to the kind of blanker courage of Julius Caesar. In the Venkatrathnam collected Shakespeare, the book of Shakespeare that the prisoners um, read, he autographs Julius Caesar's speech at uh, Act 2, Scene 2. It seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. In an address to the United States Congress in June 1990, Mandela actually borrowed the song that Shakespeare wrote at Cymbeline, uh, Act 4, Scene 2. He said, it's the human condition that each shall like a meteor, a mere brief passing moment in time and space, flit across the human stage and pass out of existence. Even the golden lads and lasses, as much as the chimney sweepers, pass out of existence and tomorrow are no more. The original line from Shakespeare is, golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. But while individuals disappear, Mandela added, they leave the people enduring, multiplying, and permanent. And I think you can hear there a very different mood of populism. You know, we're surrounded by ethno-nationalism everywhere nowadays, um, thanks to social media, Facebook, Twitter. But this different mood of populism is a much more beautiful and humane and respectful one. And I think it's true for Tolstoy and for Gandhi as well. The three of them are extraordinary because they led the Russian, Indian, and South African peoples to great collective unity, but without ever creating enmity between those that people and any other people, or without setting that people against minorities in any way. Mandela, like Gandhi and Tolstoy, was revered. In part, he, he could be the kind of leader he was because he had resolved certain internal human limits. And the fear of death is probably the most important of these limits. An anecdote offered by his biographer, Richard Stengel, suggests this fact. On an aircraft in April 1993, so he'd you know, kind of been released three years before he was campaigning for office, Mandela tapped Stengel on the knee. And he said to me, you know, he looked, said, look out the porthole. The propeller wasn't turning, but Mandela was nonchalant. Oh, Richard, he said in a matter of fact tone, would you please tell the pilot that the propeller appears to have stopped working? And Stengel says Mandela appeared as unconcerned as a commuter whose morning train was a few minutes late. He returned to his newspaper. Later on the ground, Mandela told Stengel, man, you know, I was scared up there. It's an amazing little comic story, but I think it tells you something very important about what kind of man he was and 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 what death meant for him. Was he scared up there? Mandela's writing is untroubled by any fear of death. When he talks about his father's death, he says, my father smoked and became calm. He continued smoking for perhaps an hour, and then his pipe still lit, he died. Mandela's acceptance of physical decline is evident in a letter he wrote to Winnie at the end of 1970. So this is the last long thing I'll read, and then I'll try and think of a conclusion, which I have, have not written yet. He said to Winnie, I hope to outlive Methuselah and be with you long after you've reached the menopause, when all the gloss you now have will be gone, and your body, your lovely face included, will be all wrinkles, skin as tough as that... As as tough as that of a rhinoceros. I shall nurse and look after you in every way. 
You were dazzling in that black, white-spotted nylon dress. Every day will always be March 10th, which was the anniversary of their engagement. What does age or little blood pressure matter to us? And I think in this unusual letter, which vividly represents Mandela's strengths and disposition, openness to death is crossed with relish for life. So what do I want to say in conclusion? Well, these are obviously three different figures with three extraordinary relationships to death. But I think what strikes me about all of them is it's through the infiltration of death into their thoughts and the understanding that we're creatures which die in an extremely creative way of managing that fact that some of the most important discoveries about how human beings get on with each other and how to organize society morally and socially came about. The death was in many ways, the source of some of their most profound views and some of their most constructive views. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Imran. Thank you. That was a wonderful take uh, on life and death for all three of the personalities uh, uh, under discussion. I'm now taking questions. My name is Kirti Menon. We have one question in the chat already uh, posed by Raju Bhatt, asking about whether there should have been a Truth and Reconciliation Commission after partition in order to come to a better place. And that's, of course, from an Indian perspective. Oh. I, you know, I suppose facts are never bad. Um, and thank, thank you for, for listening and also for your comments. They were wonderful. I read some of them as I was speaking. I think a truth and reconciliation makes sense when you want to form a community with, with other people, when you want to create a country that can operate. I don't think India and Pakistan wanted to create that community with each other. So it, you know, it would be hard to know where, where, you know, where the conclusion would lie. I think also there are situations where People are not simply not interested in accountability or responsibility. And one of the biggest problems with the modern world, and it was also true for Gandhi and, and Tolstoy and Mandela, is that in situations of communal conflict, people simply don't care about where the truth lies. You know, it's about, is my community going to win, going to annihilate another community or not? Is my state going to win? And I think once we're in that situation, everybody acquires tunnel vision and everyone sees only one particular side they see friends and enemies and that's it i mean that's where we are in obviously in in gaza and israel and in, in several other conflicts and i think probably i mean my view is that you know that's why people who manage to avoid conflicts that like that who practically change situations are the real heroes and that someone like mandela or someone like gandhi they avoid us being in those situations of intensified conflict once they have them can you sort it out do commissions and archives work i mean they're very you know i obviously and you know, i do some work as a historian and these kinds of archives of inquiries are really valuable to that work as a historian or writer but I don't know how much how much value they have to people whose families or communities have been obliterated. Probably not not a whole whole lot, you know. All right. Any other questions, Imran? I don't know if you can see the chat, but uh, uh, mm. references being made to your talk being a profound meditation. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the nice thing about reading, you know, Gandhi has such an enormous body of writing. We think of him as a politician, but he was, I think of him as a writer. I mean, he wrote a vast, vast, vast amount of material, letters and diary entries and speeches. And it's fascinating to just to be in touch with that, this extraordinary creativity over decades. So, you know, it's sometimes it's just a matter of combing through things and finding what's interesting about them. And what's quite interesting is uh, you can almost chart his growth and uh, arguments with himself. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Putt. Mr. Putt, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you very much. I, mean, I asked the question just now about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so I just have a little follow-up on that question. Sure. The question I have is, um, 
Supreme Court in India recently uh, recommended a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Kashmir. Um, could you give me some feedback about what Gandhi might see from that perspective and also from the perspective of trauma? Because trauma is something that's been, uh, is a new concept that's really been, has a lot of attention from people. So mm -hmm. how would his attention, how would his impression be about mm -hmm. trauma? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an excellent question, and I have a terrible answer, which is, I feel Gandhi is such an original person, like Mandela or Tolstoy, that when I feel like I'm going to predict what he's going to say about a subject, I'm really often wrong, because he just, he lived, he lived his politics in a way, and didn't, didn't always reason his way through them, so it's actually quite hard to, to know, you know, and he, he, I think nowadays, I mean, most people, I assume, listening to this, most friends of mine are kind of liberals or left-wingers or whatever, and I think we we tend to live politics in a much more cerebral way. We kind of we tend to have dogmas or views or perspectives on equality and stuff. And often Gandhi will say things that really are shocking and and really don't form part of that consensus. Um, you know, as that's why I was so interested in those letters to the European Jews about accepting that you're going to be killed. So he might well have said something like, you know, the Muslims of Kashmir should accept being sacrificed. You know, I mean, for him, perhaps dying in hundreds of thousands is not really so bad. You know. Um, and that's the fundamentally, I don't know if it's a religious, I mean, it's partly a religious vision, um, but it's it's a difficult one to um, to to um, impose on people. So I, I just think his, his, he would have had a very unexpected point of view. And I think he also would have asked, you know, he would have asked us to look at it outside the different kinds of religious nationalisms. And he would have said, you know, what what is the point of the government of India? Why is it intent on keeping this territory? Why does a state require... You know, why are states so jealous about their territory? I mean, states will kill tens of millions of human beings rather than give up a small sliver of, of, of land, you know. And in many ways, our world has been convulsed for the last three months because at stake in the in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem is a few dozen square kilometers of land. I think Gandhi would be very interested in that question. I don't know where he, what he would say. I mean, he might well say, you know, the Kashmiris should all just leave and find somewhere better to live. Or he might say, you know, they should practice nonviolent resistance, you know, whatever it is, I, I don't know. And I'm not sure he had a very, I mean, he was murdered during partition. So I'm not sure he had a, a super immediately effective answer to communal hatred. I mean, I think he was he was interested in, he was caught up in it, but I don't think he had, I think he would understand. He does, he didn't have a key to unlock it. We have another question. Uh, your view, I'm, I'm not too sure the name of the person, your view on uh, Gandhi uh, being labeled a uh, racist? I think, look, the wonderful thing about Gandhi and Mandela and Tolstoy is actually they were very open to being criticized, which is a surprisingly difficult quality for a human being to have, especially a human being who's very powerful. You know, you look at even very capable people like Barack Obama or, I don't know, uh, Tony Blair, you know, very clever people. They just cannot really manage criticism and don't accept it and, and are defensive. Whereas Gandhi, I felt, is an extremely open person and would often listen to the people who are most critical of him. And so I think we should take it seriously. I think my sense is there's absolutely no hatred in Gandhi's in Gandhi's writing anywhere. I just, I don't see it. What I do see sometimes is careless use of language or what we would regard in retrospect as careless use of language, which language we don't use anymore. On the other hand, the many, you know, language evolves over time and what's considered as acceptable. I think the most serious critique you can make of him, and he probably in a way, I think in many ways he made of himself is that when he came to South Africa, he saw the British empire as a kind of incredible romance between Indians and British people, you know, obviously, Posing it that way meant it was never going to work out because the British weren't interested in the romance. They were interested in having an empire, you know, but I don't think he saw it as a kind of joint collaboration at first between native black South Africans, Indians and British people. And I think to some extent they were left out of his vision. Um, some of that is justifiable. Some of it I think he corrected. And I think later on in life, certainly from the 1920s and 1930s, he often recurred to the thought of black South Africans and I think he tried to go beyond the perspectives that um, he grew up in and that 
that he operated in. But I, you know, I think he would concede. I, I don't think it's fair to call him a racist, although if people want to, you know, they can have whatever joy they, they get from that. But I think it's fair to say that he had, he didn't establish the kind of strong relationships with African people that, that he could have. We have a question from Uma regarding your reading strategy. Uma, do you want to formulate it? Uh, yeah, um, you know, Imran, I'm a historian, and like many historians, you know, we've read Gandhi's work, but we tend to look at the details, what he said about events, what he said about issues, and so forth. So I'm just interested in your reading strategy. I know that you read all the volumes of Gandhi, and if you look at Mandela's writings, voluminous, also Tolstoy, voluminous. How did you go about looking at these readings? Did the questions, did you have ideas that you wanted to probe beforehand or is it just in the reading that ideas came together because you are looking in terms of the three leaders you are looking at in many cases what is it that binds them uh, and in some cases what is different about them so I'm just interested in how you I think it's brilliant that you don't get bogged down by the details but you are into this is why history of ideas is simply brilliant. And I know that you came up with some real gems like Gandhi going into talking about trees and the forest and how he says, we must become like the forest. And so just I'm just fascinated with what you've done and the time consuming, I mean, how many years did you take you to get through all these readings? Well, I mean, I read quickly and I read irresponsibly, unlike you, Uma. You know, people, I always worry about not being an effective historian because historians are very careful, serious readers. And I think I read pretty quickly and unseriously. Um, but I mean, I actually reading through all of Gandhi, you know, you the Indian government produces that amazing hundred volume, it's hundred PDFs, each one of which is 500 pages. And I I think I printed, I kind of got, I printed them out. I mean, maybe we, that was back in the days of printers. And, you know, you build a, a whole tower of books in front of the door so your children can't come in and you just try and read a volume and then that goes on for 500 days or whatever you know 100 days or so and it was it's a huge thing but it's also you know it's what makes being a historian so interesting is you see day to day how well even sometimes you know you sometimes you see someone doing something on the same day two different things or thinking through two different things it is it's an amazing transformative experience and Gandhi just, he just wrote a lot, you know, and he wrote many, many different kinds of communications, poems and songs and reviews and essays. And it's just, it was absolutely fascinating to look through them. And then, yeah, I mean, there are, as, as you as you remember, there are all these amazing letters. I mean, one of them that always comes to mind is he writes a very tiny one-line letter to a niece and he's saying, dear Shanti, you know, please don't collect the snails after the rain. You know, God must have had an idea about why he put them where he put the snails. So don't, you know, don't go interfering with the snails. And there are lots of other things like that. Well, he's just a very inventive writer. I think, and you know, I think academically, we think there are people who are writers and people who are something else and whatever, but actually most people, many people write a lot in their lives and politicians and statesmen and civil rights leaders, they spend a lot of time writing. And there's no clear boundary for me in creativity between people who spend, you know, time writing fiction or, uh, trying to guide a movement. And sometimes, in some ways, the seriousness of trying to guide a movement, free a country, free a whole continent, makes might make you a sharper writer. And, might, you know, it just, it just means that you're not necessarily presenting it in the form of, you know, a, a, a novel that can be mass marketed. So it's, it's just, it's really one of, you know, I, there are many, as you know, there are many drawbacks to being an academic. But one of the nice things is you can spend a lot of time finding out interesting things about the past and, and being in the past and seeing how incredible people did incredible things or thought unbelievable thoughts and you can kind of collect them and and maybe report back on them to people and i suppose that 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 is a good reason to 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 be an academic we have one more uh, question nice to see you prof kert um we all agree that there's a need to stop the culture of violence. Is a tipping point possible? Well, I'm not sure which way we're tipping. It seems that um, I don't think anyone could have predicted the role of of um, social media in really radicalizing the world. I mean, I 
you know, you can't be sure about causality in 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 human matters because there are so many different possible causal threads. But it it does seem that we're living in a world of really of kind of communalism and extreme ethno-nationalism. And it's baffling to someone like me who grew up thinking, you know, in the same way Mandela thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be wonderful to be in a world where these identities, you know, they're, there's things you care about, but they're not things that um, confine you. It's it's very strange to be back in that world and to see people fighting and dying, you know, there are hundreds of thousands for, for these kinds of identities. I have, a, you know, one of my closest friends who's Jewish said, you know, it's it's funny, you're born Jewish, and then you get to live with all these other people. But then when you die, they put you back in a Jewish graveyard, and you only get to be with people of your religion for the rest of eternity. And I always thought that was a very nice summary of why, of of the kind of world we want to live in, you know, where where, where these identities are, are partial and allow all kinds of connections and affiliation. So I think violence is really tied up with 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 these identities and i think what's also interesting is that people almost always commit violence when they think it's just you know we we look at different kinds of violence we think that's such a terrible unjust thing but in almost invariably people who use violence um think that they're doing the right thing and i think that again this is where people you know gandhi or or mandela who who have a certain amount of self-skepticism and and distance themselves um from collective identities, as well as embracing them, why they're such useful figures for us, guides for us um, in our in our current climate. There's some very nice comments in the chat, uh, Imran, if you've got a moment to read, uh, just commenting about your talk and uh, how wonderful it is. Uh, a further question from Jay Naya is whether you think religion is at the root of all our violence today? Um, I don't. Uh, I mean, I guess you could, you know, the Ukrainian Russian conflict, it's, you know, in a way, the, the difference in Ukraine and Russia is, of course, the difference between two forms of Christianity, right? Um, uh, so sometimes these divisions happen across religious bounds, but I, my sense is religion has much more, has much to do with binding people into communities and giving them ways of being good than, than it has with, um, with conflict or violence, but it certainly can can be abused, or certainly some kinds of religion um, in every religion can can turn into uh, forms of enmity and partisanship. So uh, you know, of like, I also don't think that the more extreme kinds of religion, you know, more zealous forms of religion are necessarily more violent. I mean, if you look at certain kinds of orthodox. Islam, Sufi Islam, Orthodox Judaism, often they're about retreating from the world, not contesting everything or competing to take over every kilometer of space. So many times it's secular regimes, secular governments. I mean, you know, communism was a completely secular phenomenon, but killed many hundreds of millions of people. So I, I definitely don't wouldn't blame much on religion. And I think if you look at the conflict between Godse and Gandhi, it's a, again, it's a conflict inside different views of religion. We have a question from Jay Naya. Jay? Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, sister. Ella, I'm here. Uh, and Imran, I didn't know that you were Jerry's son. And uh, your mom is uh, in, in attendance. And we were on the ship going to India in 1964 when they were returning to write exams. So that's where I met Jerry and uh, your mom. And then the next visit was when I met them at my brother's funeral. Uh, the problem I have with religion, me reading all these books and all these you know, people around, is when we come to colonization and what happened to the indigenous people in Canada. The doctrine of discovery, if that was the root of all the uh, Christian anti, you know, re religious problems that we have now, I just want to switch this off. Oops, it's my son. Uh, it's it's we having problems with uh, the doctrine of di discovery and 
fighting colonialism. And we just can't get over what happened to the indigenous people. And that's when we ended up with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we have big you know, ideas, but we cannot deliver as a nation. So that's why I have, I'm in a, you know, I'm a historian too, but I have a problem, you know, putting religion and the history. If you look at what the Crusades did and what the Arab world did and what they did to India and how they went down. And if you go back, way back to the times that the uh, Mughals went into India. So they removed one religion and replaced it with another. So religion had some, you know, source of uh, discontent amongst the people. And then the people at the top, the hierarchy, used that and sort of uh, suppressed the person who didn't want to believe in their teachings. So that's what, that's the difficult part I have. So I, I, I don't know, I have a, a major problem because if you look at South Africa today, I'm looking at it from way, way in Canada. There's a problem religiously too. Yeah. yeah I think, look at it deeply. I think basically, I mean, you look at any human institution, they've all been, they've all led to, you know, they've all been abused or exploited in different ways and led to killing of different kinds. But at the same time, Many of the resources that we have to avoid killing and to collaborate together come from those same institutions or practices. So I think it's really about different ways of purifying or, or reusing them or thinking about them. But it may also just be economic and social development. You know, it's just we live in a very different world now to the 18th century where it was important to grab somebody else's furs or land. You know, wealth, mm. prosperity and happiness don't necessarily come from unnecessarily seen as coming from the same places and it lets us i think there's many more there's much more motivation now to be peaceful and than there was two or three hundred years ago so i wouldn't give up on any institution because it enabled genocide or or mass killing i would i would ask are there ways to save what's good about it and and to use its unifying power over people for more positive purpose but i can understand why you know, different people want to give up on religions, why some people might find, you know, Islam has in some ways done this or that, or Catholicism permitted, you know, the abuse of children in certain circumstances. And it, you know, some of those things come across as unforgivable, especially if your life has been harmed. So, you know, equally states have been, been at least or even more destructive in those situations. So it's probably just a question of trying to figure out how best to update those institutions and create guardrails so that they don't, um, and repeat such tragedies. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Jay. Uh, we have another question. How can South Africa show the rest of the world how to live in harmony after so much self-examination and self-reflection? I think That's a South tough one. That's yeah. a tough one. South yeah. Africa has many, many wonderful resources, including a uh, political language, which is about turning away from enmity and violence towards collaboration at an elite level and in many ordinary people's lives, whether they're involved in charities or things like the Phoenix Settlement or Gandhi's legacy or interfaith work, they're extraordinary new rich resources. At the same time, you can't deny that we are one of the most hostile and adversarial societies in the world. We kill each other at rates approximating a war zone. We abuse our children, you know, our teachers, um, and uh, and uh, some some of our teachers are, are are very destructive in schools. You know, young young girls get pregnant in schools. You know, I mean, our policemen. So our problem is we have many high level moral resources, and we have many serious people who who work together to try and make things better. But at the same time, our everyday ways of dealing with one another, and especially with children, with women. Are really are really terrible, you know, and and um and they come from a place of distrust and violence and exploitation. And I think the best thing we could do is straighten out some of the the ways we do these things, and um and think about what you know what traditions do we have that young men are so violent in our country, are so destructive, and and understand you know the, the thing when you read about God says killing of Gandhi, and you know I. I 
it's so interesting because Gandhi won his extraordinary victory through that assassination, and and God says death was miserable, but every crime. It destroys not only or can destroy the person who is hurt, but it also destroys the, the injurer, you know, the person who who performs that crime. And that was one of Gandhi's insights. I mean, not only his, but it was something he always stuck to is that to injure another person, to harm another person, you are harming yourself at least as as much. And I think we need to, you know, we need to recreate and reconstruct our society on that basis. You know, because I have still, you know, two of my children are very young. We I see you see that at the very level of schools, children are brought up to be South Africans and not in a good way, you know, bullying or not being honest and and um, and, and kind of uh, hierarchies of power and insult are there in our schools. And, uh, you know, we really have to think every day the small steps that we can take or larger steps that we can take to, to move away from that. Other times we, we have shown the world extraordinary things from how to play rugby to how to file cases at the International Court of Justice, and we can be absolutely proud of them. And we have some wonderful ways of collaborating and extraordinary things to offer. But I think we have to remind ourselves of those first. Uh, I think the last question, there are many comments in here, which I'm not reading. I'm assuming, uh, I don't know, Kiru, if you want to ask a question, but I'm going to ask Pingla's question. Did Tolstoy's war and peace in any way influence Gandhi in nonviolence and peace? It's uh, a fascinating question. Um, as far as I can tell, Gandhi never read it. There's absolutely no mention. There's a Russian scholar who has gone through all of Gandhi's work and tried to understand what did he read of Tolstoy's. And he clearly read Tolstoy's pamphlets. I mean, for those, for most readers, readers don't have any idea that Tolstoy has an enormous world of great pamphlets on, he wrote the first great pamphlet on vegetarianism. It's called The First Step. And if you ever want to become a vegetarian, which I'm not really, but you know, reading this, you really, you know, you realize it's the first real pamphlet on promoting vegetarianism. And then there are pamphlets on nonviolence, on religious tolerance and so forth. Um, Gandhi read those and he read those three short stories I talked about briefly. He almost certainly did not read War and Peace. But, you know, who did read War and Peace was Nelson Mandela. He just he loved the book. You know, he remembered it. It's one of the few novels he cites by name. And he really interestingly identified with a fascinating character in War and Peace called Kutuzov, who was a general and everyone underestimated him, but he, you know, he was always kind of having a good time and, and had girlfriends and read novels, but somehow he knew the, he knew who his people were and he knew exactly the right way to fight the war of 1812. And he knew to retreat instead of attack. And he knew he was going to win that way. And it's very poignant that Mandela loved that figure because, you know, in some ways he won his war by retreating to his Island and, 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 uh, and, in a sense, surviving in seclusion rather than fighting aggressively. And it's, uh, it's a, you know, his connection to that book is fascinating. Imran, I'm going to hand over to Auntie Ila, uh, who's going to formally thank you. But I think if you read the chat, you have provoked a lot of uh, thoughts in people and a different way of reading and looking at Gandhi, Mandela, Tolstoy, and maybe a different way of reading our great uh, characters who have shaped the world. Uh, Auntie Ila, over to you. Thanks, uh, Kitty. Thank you, Imran, uh, for an outstanding lecture. I really, really enjoyed it. There were many, many things that uh, I learned from it. But I just want to say your son's story about uh, I am going to die, but now I want to live. I think that that really resonates with me because we know that we are going to die, but let's live our life the best we can right now and do the best we can. So that's the message I'm going to take from your story, your lecture. I'll tell I think, him. Uh, I've asked Asha to make the final remarks and uh, thank you to everybody from Asha. Asha, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Ma. Uh, I'm assuming you can all hear me. Yeah. Uh, okay. So thank you very, very much, Imran. It's uh, It's been a long time since I saw you and it's really great to see you. And, and interact with you like this as grown up adults. We probably, I don't know if you remember, but we, <laughs> when we were nine, 
and 10, we kind of uh, hung out a little. Uh, you, you, Anushka, my, my brothers and sisters and I. Um, let me just say that as we heard earlier, this is the first of many events scheduled to celebrate the 120th anniversary of Phoenix Settlement. And what an absolutely beautiful beginning it is. A beginning that has been blessed with your thought provoking ideas in run. Each sentence dripped with meditative insights. Many of us plan on listening to the recording again. For now, let me just say that there are three statements that stood out for me. The first is that heroes can be made in the hour of defeat. Uh, I think many of us have, have been down in the dumps of defeat. And hearing that statement can, that statement certainly um, brings hope. Uh, coupled with statements that you made linked to it, I feel conversion of opponents and justice being devoid from the desire or de devoid of the desire to retaliate. I think that those statements together uh, were one sort of theme that I, that that sticks uh, to me. And as mom said now, um, in my little notes, I wrote this death as a source of life. And now that I'm going to die, I'm not going to waste what is left of my life, your son's words. And I, my little note here was that your son, son's words reminded me of my mom. And here, that's exactly what she said. Um, so I found that I will also take that with me. Uh, and finally, that if friend, if death is your friend, life has no fear, which is very interesting. And particularly the notion of a voluntary friendship with death, as opposed to you know, death being inevitable. But here you, you, you bring up this idea of a voluntary friendship with death. I must say, I have practiced Buddhist meditation uh, hours and hours and hours, you know, uh, silent meditation. And listening to you, I felt like I was sitting on a meditation cushion, listening to the most profound insights into life and death, living and dying, and how we live and how we die. From the statements in the chat, I realized that I was not alone in that meditation hall. But more than that, Imran, your talk transported all of us into Gandhi's heart and soul and his deepest friendship with death. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You took the time to read his words, to, to, to understand his ideas, to get some sort of insight into his heart and soul, and you shared it with us today. Thank you very much. You have set the tone for this year's celebration in the most beautiful and profound way. Thank you again. Uh, Professor Uma Dupelia Mestri, and Uma Didi, thank you so much for introducing all our speakers and all the, all the different elements in your distinctive style. Uh, thank you, Kirti, uh, Professor Kirti Menon, Mr. Sunil Menon, Kirti Ben, Sunil Bai, for hosting us on this platform and for assisting with fielding the questions and answers in such an inclusive way, leaving absolutely no one, no one behind and ensuring that all the ideas were shared, but most but mostly, I have to say, for preparing a moving waiting room and I understand closing music. Thank you, uh, Dr. Herschel and Narsi Hirsch for sharing your, our plans for the year in such an inviting manner that we look forward to each event. Mr. Nick Payton for the opening prayer and for reminding us of the symbol inherent in our name. 120 years ago, the young Mohandas Gandhi named a piece of land, the community that lived there, and the trust that was to manage it, Phoenix Settlement, Phoenix, a bird that rose from the ashes. Phoenix Settlement has repeatedly risen from the ashes, literally and metaphorically. Your rendition, Nick, at this historic moment reminded us that we find God under the rubble in moments of despair, among the persecuted. You reminded us also that when we find God there, hope arises and helps us all oppressed people to emerge from the ashes, from the rubble, through struggle and bolstered with solidarity so that we too 
may also rise from the ashes. Thank you, thank you, uh, Nick. Phoenix Settlement also thanks the Consul General of India uh, to Durban and the, U and the US counterpart for your unwavering support during your term here, um, Madam Thelma, but also for the steadfast support of your predecessors. The government of India helped Phoenix Settlement rise from the ashes after it was literally burned down. And it continues to do so. It continues to support our programs today. So thank you very much. Finally, we thank the government of South Africa, the office of the premier, the office of the mayor and the Durban Metro, first for declaring Phoenix Settlement a heritage site and in so doing, acknowledging its contribution to the liberation struggle in South Africa, but second in supporting its nomination as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and thereby acknowledging the significance not only of Gandhi, the man, Phoenix Settlement, the place, but most importantly, the significance of Gandhi's ideas of nonviolent resistance to oppression. On that note, I would like to end with Gandhi's talisman. I understand that it is one of the last notes left by Gandhi for all of us. And although it has been quoted very often, to me, it, re it remains a guiding light and I would like to share it again today. And these are his words. <clears throat> I will give you a talisman whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man or woman whom you may have seen and ask yourself, if the step you contemplate is to be of any use to him or her, will he or she gain anything by it? Will it restore him or her to a control over his or her own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj, freedom for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melt away. So on that note, I thank all of you for joining us today and hope to see you online or in person at all our forthcoming events. For those in Durban, the next event will be a prayer meeting in person on the 30th of January at Phoenix Settlement. Thank you very much to all of you and thank you once again, Imran. It was an absolute, absolute delight listening to you today. Thank you.
Thanks, Kitty. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kitty. Ben. Bye. Thanks, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. That was beautiful, Kitty. Very well done. Lovely. Bye. Thank you.